Okay, we're ready to start. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Bobby Ghosh. Uh, welcome to this session. Um, I hope you've had uh, as enjoyable and enlightening a day as I, I know we have had. And uh, we'll try our best to make this session uh, worth your while. It's been a long day already. Um, I'm joined here by my friend Saad Mosheni, who most of you already know, um, but for the few who don't, uh, Saad is CEO and chairman of uh, uh, the Moby Group, which uh, started 20 years ago. Uh, Tolo, uh, Afghanistan's preeminent television channel, and that includes Tolo News, the, uh, uh, a, what was then a new idea for Afghanistan, a new kind of um, a new form of entertainment, a new form of news, um, and um, broke ground almost every day uh, in both those categories. And um, this session has been entitled a Canary in a Coal Mine, and for many of us outside of Afghanistan, trying to get a bead on what goes on in the country now, especially given the difficulties of reporting that we heard uh, earlier uh, today from in another session. Uh, for some of us, Tolo uh, is the canary in a coal mine. What happens with Tolo uh, will give us a, an indication of what's happening in Afghanistan. Um, that's how I wanted to frame this discussion with Saad. Saad, for the benefit of uh, uh, those who are not familiar, um, could you give me a little potted history of, of uh, yourself and Tolo? Uh, I thought maybe we'll, the way to, to get into that was where were you 20 years ago when the Afghan, when the Taliban fell, when Kabul became free? Um, where were you then? What were your thoughts about what you wanted to do in Afghanistan? Thank you. Um, uh, 20 years ago, you need to switch it. Uh, I think almost. We were, uh, along with my siblings in Australia, um, when 9-11 happened, um, and very quickly it became apparent that Afghanistan would change uh, for the better, and we took uh, advantage of that opportunity. We went, we went back in 2002 um, and embarked on uh, a number of businesses, at least we looked at a number of sectors, including media. But media was so controversial, it sort of dragged us all in, one by one. Uh, and then it became our full-time uh, work, basically. I, I was a banker, and my brother was a lawyer, and another one was a financial analyst, and my sister was a marketing ex executive. So uh, it really wasn't by design. It was almost an accidental business. Um, and then uh, we grew that business and we decided not to uh, do anything else and focus on media and we grew that business. And then we went outside of Afghanistan. We set up operations in the Middle East and South Asia and Africa eventually. Um, and that's, that's how we started. But certainly in the first 10 years of our business in the media sector, we were fully committed in Afghanistan. Um, and the business, I mean, I, th I, th I think a lot, of, a lot of you would know that media um, was, and maybe it, maybe it still is, uh, one of the great success stories of the country. Um, uh, you know this, Bobby. I mean, if you look at, you know, even India, beyond India, you know, Bangladesh, even beyond that, all the way to Eastern Europe and most of Africa, Afghanistan has a freer market or has had a freer market media-wise than all these other countries. So it's, it's something to be quite proud of. Um, we continue, and we can talk about the challenges, but we have about 500 people still working in Afghanistan. Um, uh, it's tough, but we're still there. Um, and so are a lot of other media companies. I mean, I think we've had the sort of the, 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 the great exodus of, of many of our best, but it's extraordinary how quickly we've replaced them. Uh, people quite good actually, which means that there's a deep bench inside the country with well-educated uh, young individuals. Again, um, it's a different Afghanistan in 2022 to 2020, yeah. sorry, 2000. Well, to that point, the, the, I think some commentators, when, when the Taliban 
came back, um, there was a question about whether or not this was Taliban 2.0, whether the Taliban had changed. But what was very clear was that Afghanistan had changed. There was certainly an Afghanistan 2.0. Um, and the new Afghanistan, if I may call it that, uh, to a substantial degree, it was created by the media or by exposure to the media. That sort of laissez-faire, super free media environment helped to create that new Afghanistan. And, and Tolo was a very big part of that. Um, can you talk us through a little bit about early on when you were deciding to launch shows like, you know, the, the equivalent of uh, Afghanistan's Got Talent and, and other reality shows and soap operas and things like that. You were doing this in a country that had no exposure to that sort of television, therefore that, that involved a certain amount of risk. Um, what, what was the thinking behind launching that kind of programming and, and what was the result of that sort of programming? Well, I mean, I think uh, the extraordinary thing, of, you know, and we've done business in Africa and, and other parts of Asia, um, and we've even invested in, in uh, uh, small media companies in, in the Western world, is how similar we are. Mm. We tend to react to things in a very similar manner. That's why Turkish soap operas work in South America, and South American formats work in the Middle East. And you know, we've certainly have taken Asian formats, South Korean and so forth, and, and ma have made them success, turned them into success stories in Africa. So uh, it was a no-brainer to look at formats, international formats, and adapt them for Afghanistan. Um, our biggest challenge at that time was capacity, having the right people to produce these shows or you know, to go and gather news or to stand in front of a camera. But you didn't worry that the, that the audience was too conservative for this kind of programming? Well, I mean, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. I mean, uh, I, I, I think uh, we were nimble, we were quick, and we would adapt very quickly, and we made mistakes along the way. And certainly, uh, certain formats that we tested did not work well, and certainly there was a lot of controversy in terms of the things that we did. I mean, some of the things we faced with the Taliban, we've been facing for the last 20 years, during Karzai's time and during Ashraf Ghani's time. Uh, many, many attempts made to shut us down, um, and they're still, they're still trying today. And, um, you know, I gave a talk to my news guys the other day and said, we've been through this before and we have to persist as much as we can. Uh, of course, now we operate in Afghanistan without any safety nets, none. Uh, but then there was the international community within the government. We had people who were supportive of free media. Um, but I think the, 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 the interesting thing now is, I mean, the jury's out in terms of if there is a Taliban 2.0 or not. Um, but, um, but the people have changed, and I think that's significant. Did the media play an important role in terms of you know, uh, uh, facilitating that social change? Certainly, and that's continuing today. You could have presumably chosen to have an all entertainment channel and no news at all. Mm. Why did you decide to have news? It, very important because uh, I th at the time we felt that there was, uh, there was a vacuum in the marketplace. But also I think it's something that we've, you know, I mean, uh, one of the issues that we had, all of us I think as kids, was we watched too much television. So we were sort of used to, you know, a general entertainment network like say CBS or ABC in the US where you would have your entertainment programs and you would have a major news bulletin and then you'd have some drama series and then later in the evening you would have a comedy comedy, and then you would also have another news bulletin. And we basically took that format and adapted it uh, for Afghanistan so we needed to have news. But also I think Afghans, going back to the time when I was a kid, were always news hungry. I mean I rec recall my father listening to the BBC late in the evening Every family did. And then, of course, when the Russians invaded, when the Soviets invaded, it became even more important. So I think, you know, the Afghan population uh, demanded uh, some sort of news coverage, which we did, started off very fairly small, and then we had a full-time, a 24-hour news network um, with, you know, many, many journalists. I mean, some, I mean, almost every journalist, prominent journalist in Afghanistan has worked for us at some stage. Mm -hmm. So we've built a lot of capacity uh, over the last 20 years. And in that 20 year period, as the, the culture was changing and, and free media was contributing to the change in culture, was there ever a perception that there was a great divide between Kabul and the urban centers and the countryside? I mean, nowadays you hear people 
trying to make the argument that all these fighters, who, Taliban fighters who came in, the Talibs who came in from the countryside, they are still living in this 20-something old world. I mean, they're still living in the world that existed before 9-11. Uh, uh, before Is that true? Were they also watching uh, Tolo? And were they also watching your entertainment programs and news programs? Do you have any sense of that? I think they were watching um, some of our programs, for sure. But they were certainly engaged uh, and using technology. Even the young Taliban fighter would exchange information on Facebook uh, or use WhatsApp or Telegram uh, and would con consume different types of content using various platforms. It's funny, someone went to the prison in Bagram um, and, you know, where the Taliban were held and they're all watching Indian soap operas mm. on our network. So uh, they certainly had been exposed, but now I, I think what we're detecting is that they're continuing to watch television and, and the, the Taliban fighters. So I think this rural ur urban thing is probably perhaps somewhat true as, as it is in India and other parts of the world. Um, but you know that uh, the, the Afghanistan was 80% rural yes. in 2000. I would suspect now it's close to half-half. Mm -hmm. You know, even you know, the UN would regard the particular villages as a sort of you know, part of the rural uh, part of Afghanistan, but those villagers come to, uh, come to Kabul to work or they go to mazar -e sharif and their kids have an urban experience because they go to other kids from other ethnicities and they attend school, if they're boys, that is. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have the urban experience. They have television sets, they have mobile phones. Um, so the country has changed dramatically. I mean, I think what, you know, I'll give you some stats. Afghanistan is um, the youngest country outside of sub-Saharan Africa yeah. with a median age of 18. 60 odd percent of the population is under the age of t uh, 21 or 22. And of the younger Afghans, something like 75% are literate. And still, that population is growing at 3% per annum. Yeah. Um, now, when the Taliban last left Afghanistan, we had a population of 20 million. Today, we have a population of 40 million. 40, yeah. um, so the country has, has certainly changed. And I think, you know, you can, uh, there are a lot of people, I'm sure, in this room critical of uh, the international presence in the country. Like it or not, it helped transform the country. It may have been corrupt, but a lot of that money filtered down to the, to the very bottom. And people got an education. They got, you know, life expectancy went from 40 odd to 65, 65 years of age, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, child mortality dropped significantly. So, it, you know, it really changed, transformed the country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we started, I asked you to go put, put your mind back 20 years. Let's fast forward that to two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, two years ago, the Americans are already, they've been signaling for a while that they want to get out. Negotiations with the Taliban in Qatar are, are gathering speed. It's beginning to look like the Taliban are going to be back in, in one fashion or the other. What are you thinking at this point for Tolo, for Tolo News? Well, I mean, I think all conflicts end in some, you know, form of a negotiated settlement. And, uh, and it, it was apparent that the Americans were tired of, of uh, spending so much money and there just wasn't, the public support wasn't there for uh, sort of a ongoing US presence. And it wasn't like Korea or Japan, there was, there was fighting, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and many of the politicians saw um, this, this, you know, this, it, 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 we could all see it happening. The question was when, and you know, some of us who had expo you know, were exposed to folks in Washington and met regularly with people in the White House and the State Department. Um, during Trump's tenure, uh, we were made to understand that uh, Trump wanted out. Hmm. So it was always gonna be a question of time. Uh, and of course, when Biden emerged, uh, his views were well known. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the political class in Afghanistan remained oblivious to, to this happening. And I think one of the, and it's not my job to to write about these things, but I'm sure a lot of people will write about the lost opportunities over the last two or three years, when perhaps um, they could have struck some sort of a deal with the Taliban. But I think um, it, it sort of became apparent to us that it was gonna be a question of when, not if, in early 2021 to us. As a matter of fact, we made plans to move a lot of our people to Central Asia. Um, and um, 
and we never had the opportunity. Did, was there any outreach? Did you reach out to the Taliban? Did they reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, we had, we had discussions uh, on an ongoing basis. As a matter of fact, we always had a relationship with the Taliban, sometimes very uh, tense, and of course, uh, they targeted us and our employees. Uh, we lost 12 employees. Yes. Uh, one particular um, attack against one of our buses resulted in uh, seven fatalities, 15 injured, some very badly, permanently. Um, but we always had a relationship with them, especially the news guys. Um, we understood uh, what motivated them, um, and we understood that they're also, uh, a, you know, the, 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 a reality we could not ignore. Um, we did many stories in the Taliban as to why they emerged, going back to 2006 and 2007, when they first emerged. As a matter of fact, we, many of our people were arrested, including my brother, by the Karzai administration. I had to personally go and negotiate his release. Uh, and, and Because? Because we showed the Taliban, we showed their faces on TV, and they, they, they talked about as to why they were willing to die for their cause. Um, but in, in the lead up to last year, in your communications with the Taliban, was there any indication that they had changed? Did you think that they would, this would be a new Taliban that would be more Open more. Well, you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't deceive. Uh, t well, I, I tell a story that uh, the Taliban foreign minister, Mutawakkil, was in Islamabad telling the international community, well, we'll bring girls back to school. You know, like, this is in 2001. Hmm. We'll do this and we'll do this while the Taliban were destroying the Buddhas of Bamiyan. Hmm. So, they're, so the, the public faces of the Taliban over the last 20 odd years have always been more accommodating. Um, uh, more moderate, um, so you, you know. So the the, the 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 people in Doha, obviously, were the the public faces of of this movement, which is very much driven by its ideology. Um, so you can't kid yourself too much. But what the hope was for us that if there was a uh, a peace deal, that they would you know they would be a part of this new political order and they would see things for themselves. Um, because a lot of them actually, when they went back to Kabul, and they've told me this personally, is that they were shocked. I mean, it was you know, the equivalent of showing up in Dubai um, and to look at the buildings and the roads and the people and everything else. Um, I, I, I would say that they were you know, overwhelmed by the experience when they first came to Kabul. As a matter of fact, someone told me that the prime minister, someone you know, uh, in the know, the prime minister Hassan, when he f got the job, the, the new prime minister of the Taliban, he cried the first night, he couldn't sleep. He was so overwhelmed by this, by this challenge of being the prime minister of this, this new Afghanistan. At what point did you give up hope for a coalition? At what point did it become clear to you that there was not going to be a coalition, that the Taliban would be back running the country pretty much by themselves? Only after Ashraf Ghani fled the country. I think, I think we were hopeful because I think in, in your own way, I mean, I, I view myself as, as an optimist, you know, somewhat naive maybe at times. Um, but the hope was that even till the last second, the hope was that there could be some sort of a transitional government. Uh, maybe it was never to be, even, uh, even if the president, uh, the former president um, had persisted. But... But I think we were all hopeful. It happened too quickly. I mean, I was, I, I, I was in Washington in late July, and I mentioned to some people in Washington that the government could collapse within, by, by November, and people were shocked in November, no, November 2021, this year. Um, it happened very, very quickly. But then again, we always knew that. Even in, in the mid-1990s, when the Taliban emerged, there were only two or three battles. It was a simple case of lowering one flag and raising another. We knew that. that um, once people felt that it was inevitable, why bother fighting? And how soon after Ashraf Ghani flees Kabul, how soon do you, after that, do you hear from the Taliban saying, we're in charge, come on in and we want to have a meeting with you about how you're running your channel? As a matter of fact, we reached out to the Taliban, uh, uh, insisting that they come and take Kabul, because the biggest threat in the first 24 hours was, was just criminal activity, 
theft and thuggery and people raping. We've had this experience before, of course, mm. in Afghanistan in the mid-1990s. So there was this huge vacuum, and I think a lot of people wanted the Taliban to take over and take responsibility for the city. Um, and then they showed up on the first mm. day, on the 16th of August. At, at, at your offices? At our office, uh, offices, and we were watching it. We, we were streaming the security footage as they walked in, and they were sort of respectful. They asked questions about the security situation, and then they left. And then over the next days, they came in and had meetings, and it took them a while to appoint some of their key individuals. But um, it was a surreal experience. And at what stage, if any, did they begin to say, well, here are some of the things you can't do? Within a couple of months. You know? And then, of course, they issued this long directive um, a couple of months ago. Um, the things with things you can put on television and the things you cannot, um, but it was inevitable. I mean, I, I you know we knew that a more restrictive environment uh, was on the cards. It was just going to be a question of time. And what did you do, to, anticipating that? What, if anything, did you do to we change the way you do business? Yeah, change the way you do program. Well, we preempted, uh, but we dropped uh, everything, anything to do with music. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the Taliban, and uh, it's part of the. Uh, they are the enemies of fun and entertainment. So we yes. knew that uh, we couldn't continue with our music programs. Uh, many of the soap operas, the sort of risque, like Turkish soap operas, we dropped. Um, and then we actually started to produce a lot more local shows, uh, local content. The, the thing that didn't change much was the news, uh, yeah. in terms of our news output. But the entertainment programs changed dramatically. Your, your news uh, show, your news programming always had a lot of women in front of the camera. Yeah. Um, that continues. Okay. Is there, has there been any um, adjustment to account for the Taliban's tastes? Well, I, th I think they, they have to, yeah, they have to uh, cover their hair and, and not show too much flesh and, mm. and all of that. And they have, you know, certain requirements. But the one thing we did do was that in, in, uh, in August of 2021, we had eight women working for the news department. Now we have 22 women working for us. So we upped the ante, we employed a lot more women, uh, partially to, to make a statement, but also, uh, we also felt that it's, it's our duty to do that. So we have actually a lot more women now today than we did in mid-August. In front of the camera as well? Everywhere, in front of the camera, behind the camera, producer, journalist, researcher. Um, and how have they taken that? I mean, you were making a statement, presumably they heard. Well, I mean, we have difficulties. I mean, we had the other day, we, we, we had to cover this really important um, uh, press, uh, sort of a media event by, the, by these clerics who were for women's education. Mm. Yet they wouldn't let the woman into the auditorium. Yes, I saw that. Um, so, but the statement was positive, so the camera guy had to go on his own. So sometimes we force the situation. We send a woman to interview the, 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 a minister or someone important. And quite often they say no, and then they say yes, you can come in, but you know, don't do it again type thing. But it's, you know, it's a strange dance. We're, we're, we're all trying to get to know each other, so to speak. And meanwhile, what's happening with the business environment? What's happening with advertising revenues? So the, well, the economy is tanked. I mean, uh, yeah. you have to remember that the world pumped nine billion dollars into the country, and that went from you know uh, went to almost zero. I mean, there's obviously some funding of, uh, you know through the UN bodies, um, but the economy has literally tanked. Um, advertising revenues are probably a fifth of what they used to be. Um, and you know we benefit because we're big, and most of that advertising, most of the advertising comes to us. Uh, and I think the other media companies are really hurting. So it's it's a difficult situation to be in for all businesses, in particular the media business. So, to what I mean, television is an expensive uh, business. I mean, it, uh, it absorbs a lot of resources. A lot of us are are wondering at what point the Taliban will come and shut you down, but could it be that the business reality has shut you down before then? Yeah, so we've had, we have a number of threats. Yeah. In the first week, um, I mean, we'd show up on a Monday, people show up on a Monday, and there'd be no anchor, no producer, no camera person, no one in the control room, So because people are just going to the airport to leave. Right? Yeah. So that was, 
the first threat. We've met that because I think we're partially lucky in that there are a lot of bright kids, men and women, who just came forward and without zero experience would read the news. I mean, it was an extraordinary few days for us. And then, of course, it's the Taliban threatening the Shadistan, which they have not. Individuals have, but the institutions continue to say that we would like media to remain in Afghanistan. Um, that is a threat for us, and it could be a question of time. We're not kidding ourselves. And last but not least, it's, uh, it's the economy. It's in terms of how do you sustain this business. We, we decided when the Taliban emerged that we, you know, the, our business has always been profitable. So we, we've set aside, um, we've allocated money to this business and we'll keep us going for a while. I'm not sure for how long. But the other thing we've done is that we haven't given up on the, on the past 20 years. Is that we've, we've created, we have an operation outside of Afghanistan in London and Istanbul and Tashkent that we're producing a lot of entertainment programs specifically for the people who want to you know, watch programs which are technically banned in Afghanistan. And today, like many media companies, we're platform agnostic. People get to download our programs on YouTube or they could watch it on our app, which is a sort of a Netflix-like type app on Facebook and Instagram and so forth, short-form content, long-form content. So people have a huge selection of things to choose from that we're continuing to produce. Even Afghan Star, which is technically mm. banned, we will eventually produce, but perhaps from outside the country. With music? With everything. So we will ring fence the Afghan business, but we will also have content from outside with mm. zero restrictions. So people have the option. We were hearing at the session earlier today that the Taliban at the moment don't have the ability to shut off the internet or, or block mm. uh, uh, individual apps or... Um, as they do, let's say, in China or in North Korea or in Russia. But are that you could come. Beg your pardon? Yeah, that's, I was just going yeah. to ask. Are you seeing any signs that they're learning these skills, that there's a, that, there's a de desire to acquire that kind of... They're learning very, very quickly. Um, uh, in some ways, they're more sophisticated than the previous government. Uh, Explain that. It, well, instinctively, they, they get things. They have monitoring teams. They watch things. Um, I, I know this because the, uh, the three of our people were arrested by the intelligence agency in, um, two weeks ago. Um, they have a lot of information on individuals in terms of their social media uh, posts and, and so forth, and they monitor all the content much better than the previous government. But they will, it's just a question of time before they start to control what people consume on the internet. But the internet's now not the only way of, of being able to put things out. I mean, yes. We're on satellite, we're on terrestrial, as well as the internet. Um, and, you know, in Iran, they haven't been able to mm. shut media down. I, 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 you know, it's going to be impossible for the Taliban. Satellite, obviously, is impossible for them, unless they have the technology to interfere directly, which they can't. Um, but we have to be prepared. I mean, the it's a 50-50 thing right now in terms of whether they're going to keep the country semi-open or they're going to trans turn it into a North Korea. But if they go with the, with the North Korean option, we will still be able to get programming into the country. But will you still have... Where will you get the revenues from in that kind of a situation? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're Afghan businessmen. We cross, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But there, there, there are options. We can for programming, especially. I mean, one of the things we're doing now, which we're working night and day, is educational programs. I mean, mm. Afghanistan is like the US in the 1950s and 60s, single TV households. Yes. Uh, you know, you don't have to have much money, you get a TV set. You power it using a car battery. A lot of families have these little solar chargers. And a television, unlike a fridge or air conditioning, doesn't require much electricity. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you, ha you have this opportunity where you can, your girls can watch television and learn something. So we're working on educational programs, uh, which we will air in the mornings and in the afternoons, and health programs. If women can't go to clinics, they should be able to get information from television. Eventually, it will become interactive. But for now, because in internet penetration is relatively low, television as a medium is going to play a significant role in the country. I mean, you entertain and you educate. 
you entertain and you educate uh, and inform, but you also yeah. educate. And yeah. education is so important because of the nine million students um, going to uh, primary and high school, many of them uh, are deprived of of an edu basic education, not just because of the ban on girls uh, schooling, but also because of you know lack of infrastructure. A lot of teachers have left the country. Yes, you know, so we've lost maybe two, two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand individuals. Perhaps some of our best, you know, doctors, educators, uh, journalists, and so forth. So, as a medium, I think uh, television is going to play a significant role, a role that we cannot, um, you know, we we take that responsibility very seriously. I know you and I have talked a little bit about this in, in private conversation, but I, I thought it would be useful for the audience to, to hear this. As an employer of journalists, you have to be prepared in that environment for all eventualities. The possibility that your phone will ring and you'll find out that one of your reporters, heaven forbid, is in harm, has been harmed or has been arrested or worse. Um, do you know who to call? Well, uh, we, we had the situation yes. two weeks ago. No, we have no one to call. I mean, I, because, of, you know, I, and uh, I'm not sure if your audience is that interested in terms of the di dynamics within the uh, Taliban movement, um, is that everyone's in charge and no one's in charge. Right? So you have this movement that's very, um, so in, in some ways very fragmented, very united in terms of their ideology and they obviously they understand that their unity is so important in terms of their survival. But this women's education de decision just shows how, um, how much power is with the leader and how little power everyone else has. Um, so uh, for us, it was a difficult situation because we have our contacts within the Taliban, but they were unwilling to challenge one of their own, which was the intelligence agency. Mm -hmm. um, and so the person I was mostly in contact with was a, was a UN, hmm. ironically, uh, UNAMA. Um, and they were, they were quite good. And uh, Deborah Lyons, the ambassador who's in charge, was, uh, did her best. But we also used our own media platform hmm. to get the story out. Um, as a matter of fact, we, they were arrested because we were told not to air the banning of the soap operas, which we did. So we talked about why they, were, they had been banned and we discussed you know, that this was a directive from the intelligence agency and that prompted, this triggered this whole series of events which resulted in three individuals getting arrested, two held overnight, one tortured. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, um, it's a reality that we have to all deal with. I was, I was speaking to Andrew North, uh, formerly with the BBC, in the same cell, perhaps. Um, he was actually with 14 other people. Our guys were in solitary, solitary conf confinement. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new environment to, to navigate, but one that we have to learn to manage. And to, you know, we had a series of meetings today, this morning, actually, with the, with the, with the information culture minister. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because the advice we gave him is the same one we gave Rahim, the minister for Karzai, in terms of you have to create a commission that oversees the activities of the media and you have to basically manage it through that, this commission so then not everyone else gets involved in it. And it's almost like we're teaching this new government in terms of its dealings with the media. He personally was receptive as to whether he's gonna be able to continue doing that, I'm not sure. So Tolo prospered in a very competitive, in an open market, but a very competitive market. And, and, you know, um, now looking at it from the outside, since you're all, the, the, the community of journalists has shrunk mm -hmm. and you're all under very, um, the same kind of threat, perhaps doesn't make sense to be competing anymore in that way. I mean, do you, do, is there a sense of we're all in the trenches together, we look out for each other? Um, between you and other media entrepreneurs? Or are you, is, is there room for competition, even well, under duress? Well, I think people always compete, right? No matter where you are. Um, you know, even prison, you'd compete for the rations or whatever. So I, I think that's human nature, we do that. But however, we have to work together. And I think that um, every single day, 
our guys, uh, along with other new, uh, media outlets, get together. They meet with you know backers of, of, of supporters of media like the UN and um, other international agencies, and we obviously try to help in any way we can other outlets and their people, whether it was evacuating people or financially assisting people or standing up for them when something bad happens in terms of people getting arrested or beaten up and so forth. It's, it's always a major news for us. And that's been our mantra for the last 20 years. We, we understand we have to be this one big family. Uh, and unity is very important for us. It's the only way we're gonna be able to survive. The media, even the Taliban realize, can play a significant role. And, and, and in a bizarre way, they, they're more accountable to the public than the previous government. Explain that. Well, I think the previous government, you know, basically they, they thought that, that they were only accountable to the international community because the funding came from the international community. Uh, community and, um, you know, Ashraf Ghani never gave a press, never had a press conference. In the seven years he was the president of the country, we never had a proper press conference with the president. And that's not to say the Taliban have regular press conferences. Nonetheless, no. I think media, stories in the media uh, get them moving on things. Um, for example, we had a series of stories the last 48 hours on the presence of troops, foreign troops, inside of Afghanistan. Unbeknownst to most people, the Qataris have, have about three, 400 troops. Protecting uh, the airport or more generally? I, I think protecting the airport does, doesn't matter because the mm. Taliban have always insisted that you know, we will not tolerate one soldier, foreign soldier on our soil. And that got a whole series of things, you know, moving today, and you know, and then they made it very clear in terms of how quickly they want these troops out, and how they're going to deal with it. We wouldn't have had this sort of a thing from the previous governments. Um, in the session earlier today with the the Afghan journalists, um, there was discussion about what the international media community or the, the world at large can do to support Afghan journalists, um, what can the international community do to support Afghan media institutions? Well, Not I mean... at an individual level, but from a, from a larger institutional level. You know, so, the, so people say, you know, what role do you, can you play? Um, so Afghanistan, a totally transformed country from, to, uh, from the year 2000 or 2001. Yeah. And uh, and I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain of this, that from the, from the ashes, something interesting will rise. Now, that's going to be in six months or six years or in 10 years, I'm not sure. But I have absolutely zero doubt in terms of a, a different Afghanistan emerging, even with the Taliban. And I think the media is that bridge between August the 15th and when it rises again. And in a lot of ways, you know, it, it, we just provide that top up, whether it's with values or education, um, information, news, everything. I mean, I think that's why the, you know, the, our role is so much more important than it was before, is that that role of bridge is very important. And I think the other important thing is that a lot of people think, well, we've helped some Afghans leave the country. Um, we've done our bit, you know, through the P2 program or SIV program in the US. But 200,000, 200, 300,000 people leaving the country, we have to not forget the 40 million people still inside the country. Um, whether it's young, and I, I was with a prominent senator in, in, in Washington a few weeks back, and he said, listen, who do we help? Which group can we give money to? Which group can we give weapons to to push back the Taliban? Mm. And I said, there are groups you can help, Afghan women, um, media outlets, civil society, and so forth. These are the people who are going to push back. Now, not in a violent way, but they're going to push back. Um, my mother just came back from Kabul, and she was telling sto many stories about, you know, going to government offices, and, you know, the Taliban get overwhelmed by these women demanding, where's my passport? Why aren't you signing my documentation? And sometimes they go and lock themselves in a room not knowing how to deal with the situation. So they're dealing with this on a daily basis, and and this is why it's so important not to give up hope on Afghanistan and not to assume that just because you've gotten some people out, that's the end of the story. For us, this continues inside the country. Well, 
it's interesting. You said you, you expect something better to emerge. Mm. What's the basis of that optimism? What what the signs people. are you seeing that gives you? I, I can understand that that is the aspiration of mm. of Afghan people, mm. but what signs are you seeing that the Taliban would allow such a thing? A good question is who are the real Taliban? Yes. And just on this education thing, which is so important for all of us and all of you, of course. Um, so the majority of the cabinet agrees to uh, allowing girls to go back to school, high school. Um, the Emir, Sheikh Haibatullah, decides, no, I'm going to ban this. Only uh, people against it are like his kitchen cabinet of uh, village mullahs and maybe two, three ministers. And then the pushback, and I'm not talking about people like us, you know, civil society and educators and, and then a, a couple of urbanites. I'm talking about 90% of the Taliban cabinet, some of the most prominent clerics came out and spoke against this decision. And we, of course, helped amplify that message as best we could. So you're seeing this pushback. And I think this is where the media plays an important role. And this gives me hope that even conservative Taliban clerics are coming out against this decision saying, well, if this happens, we have to take our kids out. We want our girls to go to school, for example. So even the most backward, I mean, Afghans, and I don't mean this in a bad way, have been transformed by the 20 years of, 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 you know, of progress, of education, of better health services, and so forth. But I think the thing that gives me hope are the people, mostly. And, and there's no chance that this is window dressing, that, that you know, a year from now, when the world's attention is finally completely turned away, the Taliban will just reassert its old uh, persona. But again, the question is, who are the real Taliban? The most conservative elements, will they, could they prevail? Yes, they could prevail. But certainly within the organization itself, there are a lot of people, the dissenters don't underestimate them either. I think that there is a real possibility of the, of the movement fragmenting, if they continue to not agree on the issues. I mean, this, I mean, this governing the country through consensus doesn't work, right? Because right now, the military doesn't, you know, the, 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 the Ministry of Defense just announced yesterday that they're close to agreeing on a uniform. They can't agree on a damn uniform. Um, and so the problem that right now you're seeing is that all major decisions, they haven't been able to decide as to who's going to manage the airport, the Qataris or the UAE. Right. Decision got sent to Kandahar for the Emir to decide, got sent back to Kabul, and they're sort of close to making a decision. You know, eight, nine months on, they can't make decisions because, you know, it's a, it, it was a, it's a movement that wasn't designed to govern. Are you in touch with the Emir? I no, mean, I don't think anyone. Inter interlocutors or? Well, I think we, we have an idea in terms of his thinking, and we have people, I have one individual who's close to his, one of his close advisors. The problem with the Emir is that he doesn't even engage with his own ministers. Mm. You know, a few weeks back, a very prominent minister went to Kandahar, waited for two weeks, couldn't get FaceTime, came back. We've seen this movie before. This used to happen with Molomar. Same thing. Yeah. So, so you haven't, you know, there's a new generation of Taliban uh, commanders who are in Kabul, who've lived in Islamabad or have lived in other, you know, Quetta. urban uh, Quetta or in, uh, other urban centers. Um, their kids go to school, they watch the media, they speak more than one language, they speak two or three languages, most, most of them actually. They're very different to Haibatullah who's sitting in Kandahar, who's a, of the older generation. Uh, Haibatullah's never been to Kabul. Yeah. Right? So, he lives in a, in a suburb of Kandahar called Ainumina, which was uh, constructed by the Karzai family, uh, ironically. Uh, he goes from village to village and gives sermons, no security. He's very detached from, from everyday Afghanistan. But the other Taliban are not. You know, and some of them are ambitious, and some of them believe that they can actually play, a, in their you know, uh, view, a positive role in terms of the country's construction, reconstruction, development. So I think something has to give. This cannot continue forever. One big difference between Taliban 1.0 mm -hmm. and 2.0, if, if we're still using that uh, frame, is that this time around, China has a very different and more 
sort of forward-leaning interest in Afghanistan than it did um, the first time the Taliban came to power. Does that change things? Does that change the influence the international community, the West, might be able to uh, exert on the Taliban? The fact that there is China who have their backs, there are the Russians who seem to be willing to do business with them? No, because I think that the, the well, I, based on com conversations I've had with international diplomats, the Chinese, the Russians, even the Pakistanis, and the Iranians, they all have buyer's remorse because they all help the Taliban, or at least were cheerleaders for the Taliban movement as they took over Afghanistan. And, uh, and I think collectively they're all saying, what the hell now? What do we do now? Um, you've seen not one, not two, maybe dozens of incidents um, along the border with Pakistan. Um, I, I, the number of people killed uh, including Pakistani soldiers, is in the hundreds. And people don't talk about these things because of the fencing and how the Taliban have, you know, are offended by, by this act of s separating Afghanistan from Pakistan. There was a firefight with the Iranian um, military at, at the border. The Taliban went 35 kilometers inside the Iranian territory and they killed, I think, over a dozen Iranian soldiers. Um, and uh, the Iranians labeled it as a mis misunderstanding. The misunderstanding lasted for 12 hours. Mm. Right, so, and I, I, and I think for the Chinese also, this, I mean, the, 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 the Uyghur fighters, Etem and, and others, you know, they continue to exist in Afghanistan. They have no guarantees from the Taliban, plus, you know, besides the basics. And the, and the, and the Russians would also be petrified in terms of what could, transpire in Central Asia. So I think all these countries, you know, they, they welcome the Taliban into Kabul. Well, certainly they welcome the Americans leaving. They, you're, you're absolutely right. But the what next? They have to live with the Taliban. They have to coexist. They're, they're mm. in that neighborhood. The Americans right. don't technically have to worry about the Taliban. So I think collectively they're trying to figure something out. They talk about recognition and everything else, but I think when push comes to shove, I think that they will... I think in, in a lot of ways, they want U.S. leadership right now. And I think they, they've said to me in, uh, privately that the Americans created this mess. They have to now clean it. You know, so that the Americans just walking away from Afghanistan is also not good enough for them. Um, and um, we'll see in terms of, but they just don't have the money. They don't have the will. You know, the Chinese have given the Afghan government, I don't know, 30, 40 million dollars so far in eight months. The world was giving Afghanistan $30 million a day mm. uh, the previous year. So they don't have the resources, and they certainly don't have the bandwidth, and they certainly don't have the experience. I used to wrote that story about the Chinese yes. intelligence yeah, agency and what it was attempting to do in Afghanistan. Yeah, it's, I think, worth, uh, since there's so many journalists here and we like a little bit of gossip, it's worth repeating that story. Tell it the best way you can. Well, given I was the source of your story, but they, the Chinese intelligence agency sent a bunch of operatives uh, into Kabul to um, penetrate the Haqqani network, except they went to Kabul and they went to a local mosque and they said, who are the Haqqani guys? So that alerted this hapless, hapless uh, Afghan intelligence agency, which never got anything right, but they actually started following these guys. And then they want, went and bought a bunch of opium because they had heard that every terrorist organization has opium in their living room, which they did. And eventually they're all arrested um, in Kabul. And the Chinese intelligence, uh, Chinese uh, national security advisor had to uh, come and negotiate their release. And of course, Bobby wrote about it for Bloomberg. But, but it just shows that it's, uh, you know, some of these countries don't have the bandwidth, don't have the experience to deal with a, with a country as complicated as Afghanistan. When the Taliban came back, there was a question, and, and I wrote about it, others wrote about it, about who would be the, the Taliban whisperers, the role that Pakistan played before, whether Pakistan would resume that role, or whether the Qataris, having built a certain mm. amount of connections with the Taliban over the last few years, whether the Qataris would play that role, or whether the Taliban would reject both sides and just do their own thing. Do we have any sense of how that's going? 
We, we, I mean, the Qataris are a bit like the Chinese. They're way above their head, basically, in terms of dealing with the Afghans. I was at the Doha Forum. They had a series of announcements on, on education, you know, with Malala and you know, they, yes. all these big announcements. And, and this ban on women, girls' education really surprised them. So, so it means that they don't have their fingers on the, on the pulse. And, and the Pakistanis as well, I think that they've, they realize that they have severe limitations in terms of how much they can manipulate the Taliban. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that they have their people on the ground and they are, you know, they are working with certain individuals, but I think ultimately they too have no say, ultimate say in terms of the big decisions. I mean, I think I, I used to joke with both uh, my Pakistani and Indian friends when they were concerned about uh, the Taliban. My thing was that the formula is Afghan plus Kabul equals um, suspicion, being suspicious of Pakistan. I think anyone who's in Kabul in charge is gonna be suspicious of Pakistan. And Haibatullah himself, he, the Pakistanis have no leverage over him. I'm sure that they manipulate some of the other members of the kitchen cabinet, so to speak. But I think he will ultimately decide as to what he believes is the right deci decision for the country, which is not always the right decision. Nonetheless, I think um, there are limits to what the Pakistanis can, can tell them or they, you know, and, in terms of being able to manipulate them. One of the remarkable things about this return was, was how, how much effort the Taliban seem to have made to co-opt some of the northern um, Afghans. Um, and then more recently, I've, I've heard and read reports that that's now sort of unwinding and that northerners are once again being sort of kept out of office, kept out of positions of power, um, and that they are pulling away again. Um, what's your intelligence on that? Is there, is there that same kind of cleavage that might one day lead to civil war or not? Yeah, it's very possible. Uh, listen, you can't starve a country and deprive, say, 60 or 65 percent of the population of everything and expect them to stick by you. So uh, there, that's why there's, there's, you know, even even in the situation we're in today, there's a there's there is a window of opportunity for the Taliban, you know, for their outreach. To, to, adopt, to, to adopt something that's a lot more inclusive in terms of the governing body, but also to create, you know, it doesn't have to be a Western democracy. It can be a, through a Loe Jirga, for example, assembly of elders that's representative from our 400 districts, which now they're discussing, and I think they're gonna, we're gonna have something uh, by, by after Eid, after Ramadan. Um, in terms of what they can decide on, I'm not too sure, but the fact that they're gonna have this assembly of, rep you know, this representative body, this gathering in Kabul to talk about this new political order to, I'm not sure to debate or to endorse, but the fact that they've taken that step is, is encouraging. But that needs to lead to something else that, that's a lot more inclusive. And inclusi inclusivity, you know, is, is ethnic, um, other ethnic groups being included. Uh, members of civil society, urbanites, women, and so forth. If they don't, it's, they're just basically sowing the seeds of their own destruction longer term. You were saying that you were in Washington and, and somebody in Congress asked you who we should give money to, mm -hmm. but that, you know, since I live in New York, and uh, it, my perception is that that is a voice, is sort of a voice in the wilderness that m most American politicians want nothing to do with Afghanistan. Uh, we are in Europe. Is there more appetite in Europe to do something? Is there more capacity to do something? Well, Afghanistan, I mean, three threats to, um, to Europe as well as the US. Terrorism, of course, yeah. is one. Refugees, yeah. right? Um, you know, with the exception of that, you know, forget about the recent Ukrainian um, refugee issue, but over the last 10 or 15 years, the Afghans have always topped the chart, basically, when it comes to refugees, except for that one year when you had over a million uh, Syrians who showed up. Um, so that continues to remain a major issue, and, and drugs. I mean, I think uh, 
We are the largest exporter of heroin in the world. Um, How seriously should we take the new decree to stop opium cultivation? I think they're serious, but they're, they're motivated by other things. Perhaps, you know, some groups within the Taliban benefit more from the drug trade than others. So they've, they've, they're trying to deprive their rivals of revenues. Maybe so that's they, one. They want prices There's, to go up. Secondly, the prices have gone up. They've, they've doubled. Before, yeah. And they've, you know, the, the ban was announced pretty much after the, 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 the harvest, the harvest period. Mm. Um, it's so we don't know what motivated them, but mm. but also it, it actually could make a lot of people unhappy. And in 2001, when they when they mm -hmm. banned um, the cultivation of, of opium, that was the beginning of the end for them. So it, I think it's serious, um, but you know, we just all, all you know. They're motivated by other issues than just banning the drug. So back to Europe. These are so the, I think these the, are the threats. The, these are the threats. I mean, Afghanistan is always going to be uh, in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. But um, I don't think um, the Afghanistan story is over just yet. And I, I, and I think the world needs to pay attention. There's a the moral, you know, Afghan women and, and, and other issues that, you know, we often talk about. But there are a lot of other bad things that could, could come out of Afghanistan to the world. But are you been. seeing more appetite among European politicians to, to reach out, to have conversations, to the, resume the, aid, to... The Europeans care, but they cannot decide. And on, on, on an issue like Afghanistan, U.S. leadership still seems very important to most Europeans. How do you change, the, how do you change Biden's mind? Sadly, I think Biden's mind is, uh, is you know, set on, on Afghanistan. But I think, you know, uh, members of Congress, I think there's a great deal of, let's call it guilt, over the issue of Afghanistan. I think that's gonna keep people motivated. And uh, the, the Americans continue to fund most of the projects, the humanitarian projects inside the country. Let's see. Okay. We're almost out of time, so let me, um, you said that the fall of Kabul happened too suddenly, but you had thought about moving people out, and moving your operations out. Can you do that now? Would you do that now? We have done it now. We have operations outside, and we will, we will need to have contingency plans just in case. We do have those plans. Um, yeah, well, Afghanistan, we can never take anything for granted, but I think we have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. Saad? Thank you very much for taking the time. Ladies and gentlemen, Saad Mosheni. Thanks for joining us.